play for four months. Oh, that's that's why I was there. Yeah. 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 But I guess I should start, huh? So I'm a little tired today. You know what it's like to uh, try to keep up with people who are 10 to 20 years younger than you are? Not easy, but I think I won. Or maybe I didn't. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for coming. This is a talk on Gnome Community Voice, and I'm Sri Ramakrishna, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm part of the Old Farks Club. Uh, basically, I started, uh, I joined Gnome in 1997, maybe six to eight months after the project started. Uh, so I've been, I've been hanging around here for that long, and I'm still engaged and still excited about Gnome. So, uh, yeah, that's that's who I am. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going here. So what do I want to talk to you about today? I'm sure all of you are interested in community and engagement, um, and what I really want to talk about is how do we attract more community? Uh, you know, during the during the uh, keynote, uh, Christian Siegel uh, keynote about the class. How can we get more users? How can we get more developers? So this talk is really about how to solve that problem. How can we do that? And I am, it's, a, it's really about putting a set of proposals, a set of proposals that I think would really help us become more engaged uh, with, with the public and within ourselves, help communicate with ourselves, and uh, just general um, make, the, make the project fun. Uh, you know, that's that's one of the things when I joined Gnome, Gnome was fun. Uh, I just, I really had a, a lot of blast, especially when you're working in a corporate environment. Uh, it's always fun to kind of leech off all that energy, all these younger people who who are so creative. So that's that was why I, I was uh, part of Gnome for so long. So I talked about reorganization. How do I... How do I, how do I, what's, why, why do we want to do that? What's the problem? So, um, the problem is, is that the way we do engagement today is we, it's all centered around the engagement team. We, it's sort of bolted on, right? We don't, as a project, think of engagement. We think we have this team, it sort of goes out there, it does its thing, and, you know, developers do their thing, um, and, so I, I, think, I think if we really want to solve this problem of community, we want to integrate the engagement team into more centrally. We want, we want to move that team more centrally and have it more involved um, with the rest of GNOME than it is today. So sort of what I was thinking about is you have this engagement team. Uh, I'm sorry, it looks like I missed that one arrow. Anyway, you got to imagine there's an arrow. Frankly, there's an arrow on this one. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't know what's going on with this. So, anyway, so there are some things that we do here, and there's something new. Um, so, the engagement team really ha has uh, some, some bits with uh, forums and IRC, mostly IRC. Uh, we we handle a lot of branding and trademarks. We go out to conferences. We do social media. A lot of us have, sit there. We work on Facebook, um, Google Plus, Twitter, all of that. Uh, but there's some things are new. Uh, there's something that's new. So uh, the the things that are new is the outreach and universities. Outreach and universities. In fact, I'm giving a talk at my alma mater, Purdue, uh, in. September, and it's sort of the first for me to actually go out and speak with students. Uh, and this is sort of the motivation behind this whole thing, is because I am going to talk with students, and I am going, I want to like, I'm going to show them how to, why it'd be great to do, do open source. Um, then uh, Bugzilla, which has been a recent, recent uh, topic of discussion. 
uh, release key. Maybe that doesn't sound quite obvious, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and GNOME Lock. So these are the things that I, I personally have been tentatively been involved in. And uh, so I want to move, like I said, move, move, move much more closer, much more integrated. One thing I didn't put out here is uh, community metrics, uh, which I'll, I'll also be talking about because we've got to find a way to measure our community and how it's doing. We don't, we don't have that either. Uh, so that's that's sort of what I imagine where the engagement team is in sort of a more visual, visual form. So let's first start with Bugzilla. Bugzilla. So there is, so uh, you know, a lot of people complain that Bugzilla has a lot of people on there ranting, complaining, uh, and so forth. And I think we need to take a step back. Why people get frustrated on Bugzilla. And you need to understand that how they got there in the first place. GNOME is a really complex project. It is, not, I mean, as Christian said in his keynote, it's huge, it's complex, it's a big achievement. But when, when a user is on Bugzilla, they are focused on one small portion. They have no context about everything. So if you're adding, if they're talking about a feature or a bug, for us, when we're trying to implement a feature, we're worried about consistency of its design or anything else. So we may we may look at it and say, well, that's not going to fit overall. They don't know that. They're not looking at a design. They don't know any of that stuff. So so because we don't set an expectation of what it means to add or, or fix a bug, we're going to get we're going to get this kind of flux. And so it's really important that we, we set an expectation of what, what you should expect when you put a bug into our bug tool. Uh, you know, you know, people like to compare with the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel and GNOME have, are so orthogonal, it's not remotely funny. The, the Linux kernel, you could have, you know, four, right now we have four schedulers, I think. We could have more. They have, there's no, as long as, uh, you know, the, quali the code quality is high, you can iterate on that, but they don't generally step on each other. So we don't, we don't have that. But in GNOME, we have a design. We are the first interface for humans. And they don't have to deal with the human factor like we do. You know, something that, something that, need, that we add has to make sense. It has to be correct. Uh, we have a much bigger responsibility than the Linux kernel does. I, you know, few, Linux developers tend to think they're, you know, they, they have it, but they have no idea that we're much more complex than they are. We have much more, uh, um, uh, much more complexity uh, and things we have to worry about than, than, than they do. And um, so. So we, we have to recognize that there is a certain attitude that, that we need to set. Say, so what I propose is sort of a, a if you're adding a feature, something you put in Bugzilla, say if you're going to add a feature, it is a long-term commitment. If you're adding a feature, it's a long-term commitment. You can't go in there and say, oh, here's this feature, and here's my patch. Please accept it. No, it doesn't work that way. You're going to iterate. You're going to work with somebody. You're going to keep going through and through. You, it is a long-term commitment. Uh, you know, in, in in the Linux kernel, if you're if you want to put a, put something in, it takes 18 months to get something into the Linux kernel because you're going to you can put on a mailing list. They're going to they're going to critique it and then you can go back. It's the same thing. GNOME is the same thing. You're going to keep on iterating. And so it's important that people know that. And a lot of people who are, who are um, um, just ordinary users may not, maybe Bugzilla is the wrong place for them. 
You know, we had some discussions over the weekend. Maybe Bozilla is the wrong place. Maybe there's maybe some other way we can have feedback for those kind, those kind of people. But we should recognize the fact to actually even get to Bozilla is is a challenge in itself. If I'm asking uh, about trying to fix a bug, uh, we end up. I go into Bugzilla and I go, oh, let's see, is it GNOME Shell or Mutter? What's Mutter? Uh, there's, I don't know what that means. So a beginner has no idea. I, I, I myself wonder, does that, because you, you don't understand the, 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 uh, the, the way the, the, these components interact. Could it be in Mutter? No, 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 it's Shell, okay. so. We, we probably need to make something really, really simple. Um, they just put in what their problem is and we try to figure out how to triage that. Um, another, another issue uh, is, is how developers file bugs against each other. One, one thing we want to track is at least from a good own love perspective, is what what is easy, what is hard, what is medium, and sometimes we forget what um, we for, maybe we forgot to say it's a good own love bug. But, but even the good own love bug, just putting it is not enough. We don't. I don't. I don't. We don't really know what is hard, what is easy. We could. We could simply. I like to have a, a bunch of profile that says. This, for a developer friend, this is uh, something I think would be easy. I think this would be something hard. And it gets automatically filled out. That way when we do reports, I'm going to say, oh yeah, these, there are these many bugs that are of this level. That many bugs are this level. And then there's one that says the only the maintainer is going to do. You know, um, I, I, what, I, I try to do one feature called quarter pilot, uh, which was in Mutter. And, uh, it, it it looked like it was going to be an easy one, and then it turned out to be really hard. <laughs> because I have, we have to rewrite the entire tiling code, which I didn't know until I ended up talking to Jasper. And where I'm going with that is, even when you think something is easy, it's actually hard. So I'm sure generally there's going to be some problems just doing those profiles, just trying to assess what that is. But uh, I still think it's a it's a pretty pretty good idea. Um, so uh, I gen I really would like to encourage module maintainers to uh, launch good bugs that will help community members come there because uh, from what I understand, even the report mechanism of what is a GNOME love bug is is inaccurate. So we need to make sure that. Um, we're able to quit, be able to have uh, accurate bugs that community people can work on. So that's sort of where I'm going with Bugzilla. Now I, I, I talked about release team. That doesn't seem intuitive to, from me, but what does the engagement team have to do with release team? Well, you know, release team is the one, is the final say of is this is this release going to be good? And they generally know what features are in it, what bugs have been fixed, and so forth. But where engagement comes in is regression. Regressions. When some feature maybe have been rolled back, or temporarily, or just removed, you know? Um, you know we had some stuff with GNOME Terminal at one point. That you know, it may not be that, but later on, something happens. So the release team needs, the engagement team actually needs to be able to work with the release team and say, okay, is there anything in this release that we might run into trouble with? And it doesn't have to be good or bad, but we need to make sure there's some messaging around it because we never sure know what could raise the ire. And what happens is we want to minimize those problems. Why? Because they're a huge distraction. Nobody wants to go sit there and try to deal with uh, uh, a, the, what is it, the outrage du jour. 
right? We don't we don't want to do that. So if we if, if we have if I'm not saying that the engagement team should have some kind of beat of uh, say, oh yeah, you can't release this because of that. But it is we need to we do need to help understand that this is going to be a problem for the project. Um, or it, or it, which could be debatable, but we, we, this could be a problem with the project, and we should create some messaging around it. Make sure that we're doing uh, everything to minimize any kind of damage that we have. Uh, and so I, I think I think that I, that engagement team members should be part of the uh, release team, and uh, and help look over. Parts feature. It also helps because uh, if there's some feature or, some, or bug fix that we could talk about and say, hey, you know, over the course of time, that's something we could tell um, uh, news outlets or whatever it is, right? So that's that's where I feel uh, we could add value to the release team and to GNOME in general in our releases. Presentations and outreach. We don't do enough. I do, again, going back to GNOME is a complex project, but it, its influence on the modern distro is huge. We, there's so much of GNOME technology in a running GNU Linux system. It's, it's crazy. And, you know, any Blu-ray, um, Blu-ray, uh, uh, Unit running Linux has GNOME technology. It's got libxml, uh, and that comes from GNOME. Uh, there are the Kindle, the first generation Kindle has GNOME technologies in it. If you look at a modern distro, we have Dbus, uh, and that maybe KDbus. All that comes from it. There's, there's, it's very unlikely that there is an installed Linux system that does not have GNOME technology. And we should be talking about it. We should be out there saying we, we, we have incredible influence on how um, a modern distro is put together. And to do that, though, we need to be out there. We need to have presence. If we don't have presence, then people forget about us. So in, in, in a conference, we need to be giving presentations. I especially would love to have developers give presentations, but not everybody, not every developer can give presentations. But we should be able to develop presentations together, and be able to go out there and and uh, and give some idea of what we're doing and how it affects the ecosystem. Uh, give the right arguments. Um, it's also an opportunity to introduce new markets to you know. Uh, Automotive Summit is a good one. It's in Japan. That's and you know a lot of them, especially if they're using the Tyson stack. The, the Tyson stack has, as Nate did, Nathan Willis uh, presented last year, has an incredible amount of GNOME um, uh, technology in it. And uh, again, it, you know, I since I was a release manager for that, and it has G object. It has. Uh, Wayland, it has, it has all these things that were, it's already there that we can easily put together a product. So, um, you know, that's that's one avenue of attack. Somebody mentioned uh, medical devices. That's a, another another place. But it's an opportunity to go out there and and show what we have and how we how we can add value. Uh, but if we're not out there, we don't do enough. I don't know when they'll. I don't know. Last time we've been at LCA, I, I, I am giving one presentation at LinuxCon Europe on Builder. So you know, it's all about making sure you're out there and being able to um, show what you do. Oh, I sorry, I forgot one one other top part is going out to universities. Uh, university outreach is another big thing. I, as I said, I did, I'm doing one, but I think we really need to be, we, we probably need to partner with Open Hatch or some other organization to say, hey, you know, we, we, if you want to learn 
uh, how open source works. We're one of the best projects to do that. We work up and down the stack. There's no place that we, we're not there. Um, uh, and the open source development model is gaining a lot of traction, especially in uh, market segments like Internet of Things. Um, uh, a lot of companies don't understand how it works uh, and how to implement it correctly. And it's if we if they're able to get a pool of people that they could hire out of college that already understands the the open source model and its social aspects, um, then you know that's that's an advantage for all of us because Gnome gets great volunteers working on their stack, and the students get the, exactly that kind of experience uh, that would get them hired at these companies, and especially embedded Linux companies. So, you know, it's it's definitely a great strategic value to go out to universities and do that. Volunteer capture. Volunteer capture, what does that mean? That means can a if, if I send 30 people to the GNOME webpage, would, uh, how many can we, how could we get 30 people working on GNOME if I sent them? I don't know how well, I don't think it's that good. Um, uh, I didn't see Bastion here, but Bastion also used to, is, of course, today is a, is a very, active member, but he told me that uh, it took him a year to actually get him involved. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I was like, really? He was trying to work on the annual report, and I was like, wow, I don't even remember that. And, I, you know, there, that's one little data point that we're not, we're not doing a good job of of being able to get volunteers. And you know, going back to the Bugzilla, that's that's one way of being able to find what kind of uh, easy bugs to fix. But also, you know, if if we had a way from the front page, like a start here, where do, where do we go from there, right? We, our, the, our front page tends to really talk about our desktop and all our features and so forth. but. Maybe we need to change it, right? Maybe we need to make it more community-based. Maybe like, hey, join us and join our values, and then be able to move from there and say, okay, this is how we want to start. What are you interested in? What's, what's your uh, thing? And maybe we shouldn't, maybe there should be a name associated with it, some sort of, you know, somebody, uh, Christian was talking about ambassadors. Get, get a group of people who are interested in helping people have one-to-one -one relationships and shepherd them. You know, with Bastion's case, it was because I approached him and then I was able to keep him involved by being there. Because I was there to do that, he stayed, he stayed involved and continued. But, um, you know, I'm not scalable. Right, they're, they're, we can't do that for <laughs> do that for everybody. So and that's going to be dropped. So we need to we need to find a better process of keeping getting uh, people in there. Um, there are, there are other little bits, right? Like our documentation, developer documentation. Right now, if you go there and you look at the example, they're all bit rotted. They're all, I think, from 3.10 or something like that. But I have no idea if those examples work. We have no way of, of checking. So there should be ways to make sure that whatever documentation works, the samples we have, they all work. Right? We, shouldn't be able, we should be able to make sure that we have uh, a, a low bar of entry and that there's no, there's no perceived obstacles. And uh, we shouldn't have samples that, that are, haven't been tested um, with each release. Uh, so, so we have a lot of work to do there, and we need to really think about how how we can make a uh, better impression um, on, uh, through our front page. 
Sandbox. I've been I've been thinking about this for a year, and so far nobody told me this sucks. So, uh, uh, let me tell you the reason behind this. So, the sandbox is essentially the idea that I would we would branch all the Git repositories to something called sandbox. We'd hook it up to GNOME you know, Continuous, and we would build images. Then we would have some rules uh, against it, so really simple ones. Uh, you don't break the build, and you do not break API, ABI compatibility for, for, for a start. Uh, why do I want um, a sandbox or tinderbox or this is, is used in other, name, uh, other places? Why do I want that? Well, let's harken back to the old days. The old days was awesome. So, if you, since I was around then, I can, I, I can tell you that developers, GNOME, the people who are hacking on GNOME, their age ranges were all over the place. So, I remember at least there was one nine-year-old, there was one 11-year-old, there was a 14-year-old, um, you know, 18, so forth. So, really young developers, but um, as, as GNOME uh, matured, its code base matured, there are more people relying on it, and now, now we've gotten more conservative of how we do our changes, and there's no room, there's, so to, to hack on GNOME requires a certain amount of maturity, uh, a certain amount of knowledge on how software engineering works. A nine-year-old, a 14-year-old, really does not have that. They just want to be able to take the code and play around with it. I want to facilitate that, because having a lot of young people in GNOME is going to create just that kind of energy uh, that the rest of us need. Uh, without, without younger folks, uh, it, it, without them, we're just, we're just a conservative bunch of guys. <laughs> and, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not changing, right? It, it's hard. We're, we're, we're seeing less developers, and in order to get these guys in, I want, I want something that has a no rules, do what you like, get it out there, bring back, put, put, put a bunch of changes in, get an image, show it off to your friends. You know, now you got this image. Uh, I think uh, Andrea was talking about like a Docker instance that you could get back. And, and it would be like, it's like, hey, look, look what I did. Now, does anybody see what could go wrong with that exactly? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> what, what, what could go wrong is person comes in and um, implements a feature shows it off to the crowd. The crowd goes, wow, that's awesome. Is it going to go into GNOME? GNOME says no. And then, that sucks. Oh my god, why is GNOME sucking like that? Why can't they fit in there? We don't want to do that. <laughs> we don't want to go there. Yes? We already have that with extensions, right? To some extent, yes. We have that with extensions. So it's not, it's not outside the... <laughs> yeah, so, it's, so it's not outside the realm of experience, uh, outside the realm of possibility, right? So, so, but what we could do is we could say straight out, we're not accepting your contribution in, because it requires a lot more. Hey. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is we already have the protocol in place applied to other aspects. Mm -hmm. that, so it doesn't mean we don't have to do this. It's more about applying the same. Right. Response protocol. <laughs> right, right. We have yeah. four extensions. Yeah, but it, we need to spell it out. Just like yeah. right, when I was talking about Bugzilla, we need to spell it out. This is what our expectations, this is, you know, those kind of things. If you don't spell it out, in, we have no way. They can't just suddenly do it by reactionary uh, responses, right? It has, we have to put the rules in place. We also say branding, that's not going to. What comes out of Sandbox is not going to. And, and and you should not even think about what that is because somebody could easily use it as a fork and then go off and yeah I, and 
I, I do have, if you don't mind me. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so I, sometimes I do have mixed feelings about, uh, you know, the implications of what it is to be a GNOME app, for example, what is not to be a GNOME app, or what it is to be. So um, I guess what I'm saying is like, I, I feel sometimes we're being too exclusive mm -hmm. with the way we use the brand. And for example, an example of this is, uh, we were having a discussion on Twitter the other day with Emanuele with regards to, that's not a GNOME app, and it's like, where it's not written anywhere what a GNOME app really is. So it's like some sort of weird consensus around the design guys and some developers what right. a GNOME app is or isn't. And I sometimes feel that we should be more inclusive because mm -hmm. I, I see that, I see it often that people from the outside feel like we're this group that it's really hard to get into. Right. And if we were a bit more loose about our, uh, about what it means to be GNOME, <laughs> uh, maybe people will feel more inclined to work with us. You sure. know what I mean? Sure. Uh, which is different than saying this is an official GNOME release or this is a GNOME certified app or whatever you want to call yeah, it. That right? it's a naming, be, it's yeah, that's a naming. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get into the naming thing. Sure, but sure. But I, for me, the point is uh, like maybe we should not react to things that are not up to our standards in such a negative way. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Cause the fact that someone is out there, I mean, it's hard enough to write an app, even if it's not, you know, so the fact that they're using our technologies is something. It's great, as it is, right, right. That's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. Uh, I think, did, did you have a question or I just had a brief point on that. Okay. So the only thing I would say there is, I mean, I think that people, I kind of agree with you, Alberto, like people in the GNOME project use the word official a lot. Which I find hilarious considering that we're like community driven open source projects and we're always talking about what's official and what's unofficial. And that always seems a bit bizarre to me. Um, but coming back to the, the, the question about applications, I, I think the key difference there is whether we're talking about core apps, like the kind of stock applications, and I think in that context, um, whether something belongs within that set is, is meaningful. But I, I agree that outside of that, I don't, I don't think we should be all that concerned about what we include and, and what we can validate and what we don't. Do. But from a design point of view, we do have specific no, criteria no. for the core applications. And I, 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 yeah, I agree with that. I completely agree with having high standards for what we do. I have no problem with that. I'm just saying that sometimes I've seen instances of people being somewhat, even without wanting to be like that, but like treating other projects in a way that is, it might be alienating for the people writing those projects. I know that people are wanting the other way. You know, it's, again, it's this question, how do I, how do I get in? Like, like what, is, what is my path to entry is often what someone is asking when they're saying, how do I become a nomad? It's, it's about the boundaries of the community rather than some kind of trademark sticker that we put on something. All right, so let me, I got one more last point. And so the, the other thing is, is community metrics, right? We don't, how do, you, how do you know? When you ask the question, how is our community doing? We, we don't really have any way to say that, right? It's, it's a sort of, uh, we sort of wave our arms and say, yeah, I think we're having less people this year in Guadalajara. Like, I think, I don't know, do we? But I mean, so we're not, we're not collecting these things so that we can monitor our, our community. So, but what kind of, but metrics are, it's, it's fun and, and great to collect metrics, but they have to lead to actionable things. We can't, we can't be just collecting metrics for the sake of metrics. So we had this idea of doing weekly metrics. And, but if you just do weekly metrics and you release it day at, week after week, it's going to uh, peter, up, peter up. So they, they need to link to some sort of actionable way of doing something. So what would be, what would be interesting metrics to me? Well, um, uh, one metric for me is how many patches on Bugzilla uh, were submitted by someone who is not a good, good, a good person, 
or is not a um, is not a maintainer. I would be interested in that. I like to know, and I would like to call those people out every week. Those even if even that patch was in the stupidest patch or the craziest patch, whatever it is, they spent just still spent the time to invest their their time their time into creating something, and we should at least acknowledge acknowledge this. <laughs> Good stat, <Jim. laughs> Anyway, uh, I'll speak louder. Because <laughs> now I can... That's on. It's on? Okay, great. Although I really have to put my mouth close to this mic. Um, so, so those are... Interesting things. So, so yeah, we can do our usual Git metrics, things like that. But you know, it's it's the one that it's trying to find things that are unusual, unusual patterns. Uh, people who are doing things that are going under our notice, uh, our notice, right? Those sort of things is what I'm interested in. Um, how many? Let's see. Uh, what are the active bugs like? That there's a lot of comments on those things. Where are there's some one some I don't want to track? Like what's the oldest bug? That the, <laughs> there's a good reason for them. I don't want to use metrics that could um, uh, be used against us uh, unless unless uh, they're sort of private. So there's some public, there's some private. Uh, you could argue everybody could put it out there, but. Um, uh, some things may or may not be fixed, and I don't. I don't want. I don't want them always out in public, like a sore thumb, just sticking out there that never, you know will never get resolved. Those are not metrics we want. We want to. We want to uh, have in the public, um, but, but you know, that's sort of something we as a project need to decide what, what is important to us. Um, but the engagement team should go over those metrics every week. Um, and really ask themselves, how's the community going? Uh, first is uh, another good metric says the GNOME love bugs, right? If every week, 10 GNOME bugs and it's unchanging, well, we have a problem. Nobody's working on GNOME love bugs. That needs to be important. That should be important to us. GNOME bugs are not, are not being fixed. We need to go find somebody to fix them. Right, that lets an actual plan on a uh, on a uh, 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 on a on a measurement. So those those are things we want to do that. And and if you don't have that review, then you know it, these metrics are useless. So metrics drives purpose. Um, so that's that's sort of where I'd really like to like in a bob or something is sort of come up with these. What kind of interesting metrics uh, that we could come up with? So I'm going to wind down now. Uh, so so we, we want to we want to really bring if we want to bring community into um, the project, we really need to lower the bar of getting people into the project, getting them useful. Uh, we need to find a way to measure uh, our, our community and our success. We need to um, make sure that we are not doing things that would bring negative light to us. And we need to make sure that community is a first class citizen. In, in GNOME, not something bolted on. So when I when I wrote this talk, I was super excited. I mean, as I was writing, I was getting more and more pumped up about what we could do, how can we do it. You know, there's just just there's just a huge uh, realm of possibilities. And, you know, and I've been doing a lot of social experiments about how to bring <coughs> volunteers in. 
uh, it, some of them I've, I've discussed with other people, uh, like uh, going to meetups, right? Go, you go into meetups, you, I, I used to go to these startup happy hours, and I would always come back with two or three email addresses. Two or three email addresses. And that are people who are interested in what you're doing. Because when I go, I am not, I don't talk about get on the desktop. I talk about our values, I talk about our community, I talk about the kind of things that uh, are, you know, outreach program for women. All right, those are things that people tell me get really excited about. It's not about technology, it's about our community and about our values, and that's the hook. The, the desktop is there to keep you there, but our community is the biggest thing that will draw people to us because it's an awesome community. Uh, so that's really all I wanted to say. I would love to take questions, or if you've got interesting metrics you think we could do, or, you know, or any kind of feedback. But, but the, the, the one final thing I want to say is we're all, we're all invested in, in engagement. It's not something that belongs on the team uh, or on the board. Every one of us is accountable in helping bring people in to, to the project. So uh, I hope that all of you will take that to heart and, and, and work hard in bringing people into GNOME and building an ever uh, a sustainable community that all of us would, all of us would love. So QA. I can have one remark. Sure. So yeah, so something, for example, that you touch on in your talk that I, I, that I as part of the engagement uh, team would find that the engagement team could have more conversations with other teams, like uh, for example the release team, maybe as a meeting or something, mm -hmm. to be able to better coordinate. Sure, our absolutely. Um, that I think would be great. And also it could work more with the uh, contributor story. mentioned that the, the engagement team will have a bot on the 11th. Uh, these six bots that are available on the wiki, so if uh, anyone is interested to learn more about what the engagement is up to, that is a good opportunity to um, You mentioned that uh, maybe reorganizing the homepage to engage new volunteers is something that is interesting to lots of people. Um, what is the process for making such a change? Is that, does the decision power lay in the engagement team or is it a community thing? I'm not really Dude. sure how. You have to get Fabiana to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm done with Roderick. <laughs> No, but um, there's no, for, uh, at the last uh, engagement hack fest, uh, we wanted to, we discussed a, a website redesign, but we wanted that to be not just a change in style or colors to make it like interior design or fancy or whatever, but mostly something that would reflect our current state as a community and uh, our, our vision for Gnome as a product. So we started discussing um, our, our values and our, our core mission, and, and we actually put some of those things that we came up with in, during that Hackfest on the website. Uh, and, uh, and we were hoping that the community would get, give us feedback on that. So basically the process is, is we, the engagement team has been putting stuff out there and we expect the community to just uh, give us feedback and then they keep iterating. And, um, I think that has been actually one of the main blockers with the website because we are just trying to have this grand vision of what the new website could be and maybe we should just start with small changes and keep tweaking it the, uh, one thing at a time. So if you definitely have a, like suggestions, we can, we can definitely start tweaking it instead of just coming with some grand reason because another thing that I actually wanted to mention as a question is we lack resources on the engagement team. Um, the engagement team, I'm going to say it, it's a dead team these days. Uh, we have very little activity. Um, 
and that was actually my question to you, is how we can, before we even talk about having the engagement team interact with other teams, how we can make sure we're actually an we active actually, yeah. team. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I reply that? Uh, so I would not, not say the engagement team is, is that, I would say that is an overstatement. There's some activity, at least, uh, at least that is my, my view. Well, you're um, very much all of us, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, and then I would also want to add that the website is a topic uh, on the agenda for the for the bot also. So uh, if you're interested in that, it could be uh, could be good to attend it today to attend the bot. Also. Uh, there's a couple there. I I'll add I'll answer your your team growth question. Uh, so. Uh, this is uh, more statement. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I uh, don't think that uh, the website sh should be the main uh, or can be the main engagement tool uh, because a lot of distributions uh, now install GNOME by default, and I don't see how uh, a website that is never visited by an average uh, user could uh, help us. Uh, with engagement, uh, that is how to convert a user of the default desktop environment uh, uh, that is installed with the distribution into a good member of uh, our community and not just the user of the default desktop. How can a website help that? I think that's a good point. Like, not all users are going to come to GNOME.org because they don't even know they're running GNOME, right? They're running uh, Fedora or Suja or, or something else. Um, but I think there are a lot of people who are coming to the website, and, and they are perhaps already enthusiasts by the time they come to the website. Um, so we're not, by, by engaging them in the website, we're perhaps not creating enthusiasts. They're, they're starting as enthusiasts. But we could do a better job of taking these enthusiasts and turning them into contributors. Uh, it, this is just a data point uh, for reference. Uh, a big chunk of our visitors on the website are using Windows. <laughs> yeah. So either we have potential, or some of you have been fooling around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so. I told you I go out to um, these uh, entrepreneur meetups, right? I need some. I need somewhere to send them, and somewhere they can get their information. So I think it's. I think that uh, if, if we only look at the distro, then that's that's just one story. But if you're looking to grow and you're actively trying to grow people. Um, the most effective way of doing that is personal communication. It's not, it's not simply, uh, you know, we're using it through the distro model. It's only when you go out there and, as I said, presentations. If you're doing a presentation and people come up to you and say, well, you know, go to our website. We have a lot of that information out there. Your, the, the website is your first conversation you have after you've had a one-to-one -one uh, conversation with them. It's where they learn more about you. And so it's, it's so I think the website is a, a really important engagement tool, in my opinion, simply because that that is the way, that is your one way to tell your story uh, in, in the most personal way you can. So, uh, and you know, there's, there's all these things we do and uh, we, want to be, we want to be able to show that. Um, yeah, what I wanted to say with regards to your question is that um, if, I mean, I would expect that naturally, like if someone installs, for example, Fedora or OpenSUSE or whatever, and um, uh, they get enthusiastic about it, they go to the website of the thing they install and they get involved, eventually they're going to learn about GNOME and they're going to go like, okay, how do I contribute to GNOME? They're going to go to our website first thing to figure it out. So we need to make sure, even if it might not be the only point of entry into the community, 
it's, it's gonna, I mean, people are gonna go to Google, GNOME, and the first thing that's gonna show up, hopefully, is our website, and we need to make sure that, <laughs> we need to, and we need to make sure that once people get to our website, we do our best to fix that potential uh, contributor into our community. So I think even for your use case, uh, it's it's very valuable to to invest as much as we can into into our website, um, as well as other tools. But, yeah. oh, sorry. I made a sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other thing that was interesting to me is that you s mentioned a bunch of um, uh, software projects that use GNOME, but nobody really knows if they use GNOME. Um, and I was wondering, is there a place on the website or something that says, like, fun facts, or that specifically talks about that? Okay, because that could be really useful. No, as well. but Ella has a comment on that. I, I, I'm pretty sure we don't actually talk about our I, I have some work in progress to add that to the website, um, and that's something I would really like to work on on Tuesday. Like I've been saving that because I've been I need help from a web developer. To get finished, so, um, How did you get to put your web development team to organize that? Like? Yeah, I know, I know. Um, one more general point I would I would make is that not all engagement activity happens within the engagement team, of course. So even if we don't see huge amounts of activity on the engagement team mailing list, that doesn't mean there aren't individuals out there going to conferences, giving presentations, going to the local user group. And I know that there are individuals within the community that do that regularly. Um, so there's a lot going on that we maybe aren't always aware of. Um, I think one, one, one question I have, or something I've been thinking about, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you think of this, Sri. Something I've been thinking about recently is confidence. Like, I think sometimes we lack the confidence. Like, we've been around for a long time and we've become a bit desensitized, well, a lot of us have been around for a long time and we've become a little desensitized. And I think some, one of the things that we maybe need to do as a project is we discover our confidence in what we're doing and where we're going because we, we, you know, we hear about it all the time at Quadec about our achievements and the exciting things that we're doing and how important knowing is. And I think that's all true, but we need to we need to internalize that. And I think that's that's the only way that we can really go out there and speak to the wider world about what we're doing. Like, like we were talking about last night, like, how many people do we see out wearing a gnome t-shirt and being proud to wear a gnome t-shirt? So I, think, I think the question is, what, how, 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 do we, how, do we, how do we foster that kind of attitude? And I think um, that's something that, the, that we need to think about. And I've got a few ideas about how, how we could do that. Because it's, it's, we should feel proud. We should feel confident. So the question is, how do we make sure that we, we really are? Simple question I have. <laughs> uh, I know. And then like, OK, let me have, figure out a process stuff. Um, I just want to add comments based on Alan's um, about the spirit of the GNOME. I think uh, I just. Uh, We'll continue our discussion with Suri last, last yesterday. Uh, we talk about a slogan. Um, you, you say community is uh, more than, it's a, um, GNOME is more than code, it's a more community. How about uh, we think about uh, brainstorming about a slogan of the GNOME community? Like I know Apache have a slogan, it's called uh, uh, Community Over Code. Yes. I recently they called uh, uh, Community Led Development. Maybe we can think about a better, more inspired people yeah, you, slogan. Yeah. You're talking like a, uh, about an organizing principle uh, uh, or a, a something that's kind of, that kind of gives you direction to the whole project. A mission so, statement. Huh? Yeah. You need a mission statement. Yeah, you need a mission statement. Yeah. You need something. So we had, we've done this before. Uh, we had a 10 by 10, uh, if people remember that. Uh, but it, 
it did it did it did do its job of rallying around it. Now, the problem was was that it was relatively unachievable uh, to to some extent. Uh, ten by ten, it's supposed to be ten years where we get ten percent of the desktop. Well, it was in two thousand five, so in five years. Yeah. We get to ten percent. Twenty ten. Twenty ten. So. Uh, but we could we could come up with something else that would inspire people to and rally them around, you know, something that focused them on a particular target. Uh, right now, we don't really have a target. Sort. I mean, we, we're we're kind of evolving, but evolving without a kind of end state uh, that we can communicate to people. And so, if you don't have the the end state. Uh, that, that sort of, this is where we're going to end, then it's kind of hard to focus everything around it, so. I, well, I'm not sure if, if it's the same plane, or, or at least the same uh, thing that Adam is talking about, but I've, but I've been, uh, it has to do, I guess, with, with the fact that some of, us, some of us have been around for quite some time now, uh, but I think that I remember myself when I was maybe a bit more enthusiast. I mean, I could spend less time, so maybe it has to do with that, but uh, the fact that I will still believe that we will get that 10% made me, you know, uh, that, that sense of naiveness, if, if you will, will push me a lot harder than maybe these days, because of experience, I'm more skeptic about... <laughs> um, the potential. I'm not trying to be pessimistic here. Just saying, you know, with experience, you get more conservative at times and less. You know, sure. When, when someone brings a big, oh, we're gonna, you know, get there. You're like, well, but there's there's this problem and this problem and this. But, and so. but that's why youth was. In, that's that's why youth is important. That's why we need youth, right? As we get older, we tend to get a little more cynical about how things are. But young young people, you nine, fifteen, are are full of energy. That there's a whole bunch of possibilities, and you need that. You need you need to kind of grab onto their uh, their uh, kind of hopes and dreams about things because we do we we do, as we as we get older, we do get cynical about it. We get beaten down by a lot of stuff. I mean, all of us have probably been involved in some flame war, I mean, pointless flame, flame war, right? Uh, some drama internally, externally, whatever it is. You know, uh, over a long period of time, we, we, it does kind of affects you, especially as a developer who, who has put so much uh, thought and into their own code and to have people repeatedly tell them that you suck is it, it breeds a, 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 a breeds cynicism. Uh, so people like me, I'm divorced from the code. So I don't have that same kind of emotional connection, which makes me much more effective. Because when I go in there, I, I want to win, <laughs> right? When I go in there, I want to win. And I, I will keep going after people Um, I, replying to your point, I think, like, the more, when we're, like, starting contributing to Gnome, we're also, we have, to a large extent, I feel we have more perspective, because we're still in that border of the community, like, we still see outside, and we, we still, it, both sides, like, inside and outside, and after you've, like, been contributing for a while, you start, like, lacking that perspective from the outside world, so, I think that's one, one thing that might give that sense of, like, this is hopeless, Kind of, um, but uh, just a little tale to give you some hope. Uh, my company is one of those companies where everyone is like uh, MacBooks and running macOS. And when I started uh, two years ago, there we were five, four or five Linux users. Uh, after 316, the release video just like everyone started sharing it internally. It was like crazy, and it was this is really cool. Maybe we should switch, and now we're almost 20. So. I think there's hope. I think uh, it, this is pretty cool. It, it, whenever someone says, I'm going to switch, I think, and I'm like, you should do it. And then they showed up with some 
like Fedora computer and I was like, wow, that's amazing, they actually did it. So, yep. <laughs> Yeah, we got. Yeah, we just got lunch. So if you, if people want to stay and talk more. And okay. Uh, some uh, quick idea about the engagement. Um, I think engagement can be uh, divided into two: online and offline. I see a big picture of the engagement team. And for the uh, for the online engagement, I think one area maybe we can think about is the M O O massive online massive online open course mock. Uh, we you know we go to conference and give speech to people, but it, we can only engage with people like hundreds or maybe thousands for a huge conference. But if we have presentation online and make it on a mock course, we can engage with more millions, more people there. And I think for mock um, course, uh, it takes time to have a high quality course. Maybe we can think about uh, have a project like in Women Outreach Program, or maybe Google Summer Code is not a good. Program, yeah, but what what kind of like courses are you? Do you um, like uh, uh, how to develop with you know, like uh, what uh, some basic some basic course like uh, five or zero uh, five or six <coughs> series and each course are uh, fifteen minutes and we uh, we develop those course and uh, we we contrast it in all languages and it's promoted all over online and it it, it takes times yeah. nobody maybe uh, everyone has a job nobody. Uh, may have a spare time to do it, but maybe it is a good program, an outreach program, and people are getting the bonus to do this. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people do learn like this now, right? Like, I mean, people who got regular jobs during their lunch break, they're looking at videos of how they can do other things. Right? So if you had, like, so a lot of people do this now, um, young people do, and it's, if you had a video for, say, um, maybe half an hour or a, a series of just half an hour talks, which is like, this is how G-Object works, this is how uh, Grid works, this is how you can develop applications for GNOME. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it could be quite interesting for people to get involved that way. I, I find that interesting that this generation does more video, and I've always been, I, I, and it, we have this at work now because we're looking at videos, and it's always funny because who could sit there and have the time to watch video? And uh, I, I just prefer to skim and read docs and move on. But uh, but now they said that's what people do. They sit there and watch YouTube videos. And so. um, I, I made one of those videos, <laughs> uh, but just one. <laughs> this is very time consuming. I too, like write, the, recording the video is not the hard bit, it's writing the script, uh, recording the audio. And then doing the timing with while well, you're typing the code, and well, so after doing the first one, <laughs> and then that code got deprecated because then GDK three came out, and uh, but but I but you're absolutely right. Like and the reason I did that video was around the time when Ruby on Rails got really popular, and it was because the screencast that allowed you to write your own blog system in like 20 minutes, and we can do a lot more of that. It's just we, we need more people. And we need PTV, not crushing. God let So, any any other uh, stuff people want to talk about on engagement? How, how about I give you guys some homework? That's another video. Welcome. We talked about we we talked about a, a kind of a mission statement, right? How about all of you think about what that mission statement would be? <laughs> it's a challenge. I think you guys can do it though. What excites you? What what do you want where do you want to see? What's your vision? You know? So last year Yeah. Are being challenged. <laughs> right. Yes, I remember uh, that. So it, it, it's challenging because we are we are so many things at the same time that a single mission statement is it's hard. Because <laughs> on one hand, I, I think it is it should be a role to provide a, a free software. I would say operating system rather than desktop uh, that allow 
that is accessible by everyone, anyone, regardless of their you know physical abilities or their language or their cultural background, and also like that role with regards to privacy and protecting the user from you know external forces. I don't know how how we would put it. Condensing all of that <laughs> into a thing, and then we also want to promote the software and grow the community and send a message that isn't you know engaging to, to people so that we don't only say this is what we want to do but also come do it with us. So I guess I guess I'm just you know <laughs> listing things here sure. aspects of so what probably we want to condense but it's hard because it's to my right. friends. So how about we do this instead? You tell me what excites you about you know and where where you would like to see you where GNOME is, like for your particular set of experiences. And then we can correlate through them and make a list and then see what story we can come out of that. What's the story? Maybe we, maybe it's hard to come up with a mission statement of sorts, but I would be really interested to see what people, where people want to take GNOME all, all together. Maybe we, there's something interesting and cool uh, that, that can come out of that. I, but I want the exercise. I think the exercise itself is important uh, because because I, I want to see what people think and what where their headspace is on this. Yeah. Where do you think you know should go? What excites you about you know those two things? Take it with you. Tell me what you think. If everyone's on planet now, it might be interesting for everyone to. That's a fabulous idea. I, all right, I want all of you to post on my you know, is Where do you think, what do you, what excites you about GNOME, and where do you want it to go? Just put it out there. Not Twitter, not anywhere else, but on Planet GNOME. Oh, should I stop tweeting? <laughs> <laughs> you can tweet that, I'm going to post them on <laughs> and I'm going to say this. <laughs> So, anyway, uh, thanks for coming. I, I, we are like almost ten minutes over, so it's it's great to have so much participation. Um, and I hope I can see some of you at the BOF, and we can uh, we can rock and roll on and do some do some actionable things that has a that has some tangible result. So, thanks again, guys.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 interesting um, you know what I, what 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 we sh one of the things that I've noticed that puts people in is giving them responsibilities by actually giving them something like I have to say like when I called out for help Basically, right now I'm just... Uh